During that time, I just, it was just like someone unplugged me from the wall and I just fell into a dark pit. I just had no energy to do anything and ended up in a really huge time of suicidal depression where I just felt like all the work I'd done on myself and all the acts of courage I'd taken and all the decisions I'd done that was honouring my heart was, and I still hadn't got, I felt like I hadn't got anywhere. I was like, okay, well, I'm still here. I'm still in pain, emotional pain. I'm still financially not strong. I'm still not knowing where I belong. And yeah, and so it got really bad. Hi, friends, and welcome back to At the End of the Tunnel, the podcast about hope, and more specifically about regular people who've started extraordinary movements for social good. And this week, I'm talking to Bronnie Ware, a former palliative nurse who wrote this article in 2009 called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And little did she know it would go viral, being viewed over 8 million times, and it helped to change the way that many of us now think about death. So Bronnie had a very interesting journey. She grew up in rural Australia, where she was the lone vegetarian in a meat-eating family. I know what that feels like. And she tried the regular job thing, as many of us do, but it just wasn't working for her, no pun intended. So she quit her job, and she started nomading around before nomading was even a thing. And that's how she found her way into palliative care, because she needed a place to stay And one woman who gave her room and board ended up transitioning. And that's what palliative care means. You look after dying patients in the last 3 to 12 weeks before their transition. So as it turned out, Bronnie was a natural at helping people transition. Her goal was just to treat everyone that she looked after like they were her grandmother. In the process, she observed how much people grow when faced with their own mortality. And how each person experiences a variety of emotions such as denial and fear and anger and remorse, and then more denial, and then eventually acceptance. And she reported that every single patient she worked with found their peace before they departed. Every single one of them. And when questioned about any regrets that her patients had or anything they wish they had done differently in life, she noticed that five themes kept emerging, with the most common one being, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life that others expected of me. Then there was, I wish I hadn't worked so hard, which was reported by every male patient she looked after, followed by, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings, and I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends, and then finally there was, I wish I'd let myself be happier, which I'm sure we can all relate to. Initially, I connected with Bronnie through social media because although I had heard about the top five regrets for many years, I never knew the author that was associated with it until I made one of my daily insight videos about the top five regrets and one of my followers connected me to Bronnie and immediately I knew that I wanted to share her backstory. So as usual, the universe conspired to bring us together And as a result, we got to do a deep dive into the genesis of her palliative work and how the top five regrets came to be. And you're going to love hearing Bronnie's story because she's lived almost exclusively from intuition without making many long term plans and even without much consideration for how her dreams would eventually come together. And I think her life could be a blueprint for many of us who want to take that that first step in the direction of our life goals. But you're just not quite sure where to begin. So guys, grab yourself some tea, sit back, and enjoy this fascinating conversation into the life of Bronnie Ware. Bronnie, thank you so much for joining at the end of the tunnel. I'm super excited to have you on and just I'm so grateful that you agreed and you accepted my invitation. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Lodge. Thank you. You're welcome. So as always, I like to start these conversations talking about childhood. And my question for you, just to lead the conversation off, is if you can think back to the old days in, what is it, Northwest, New South Wales, (laughs) where you grew up, what was your favorite toy or activity as a child? I think hanging out with my dog was probably my favorite thing. 
we also had horses and I spent a lot of time swinging from the rafters up the top of the, the hay shed and falling down into big piles of hay. And yeah, I, I think my most peaceful time and happiest time was just being with, with my dog. And I was a little girl when I got her, so she was called Princess. And and as, as an Aussie, we abbreviate everything. So Prinny and yeah, Prinny was probably the highlight of, of my childhood in that regard. So it's kind of, if you've ever been around dogs, it's kind of self-evident why someone would love dogs. But I'm just curious, in your younger mind, what about that relationship with the dog did you enjoy? I think that in hindsight, because it was safe and that she loved me unconditionally. And yeah, I just, I didn't have to be anything other than myself. And she was just always there. And I felt understood, I guess. Mm. What kind of dog was she? A bitzer, bitzer everything. That's what they call them. <laughs> but what we would call a mutt over in the states. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, I guess we, we do use that term sometimes, or or a mongrel. You know, like a mixture of things. But but yeah, bitzer is what I always knew her as a bitzer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And word on the street is that you were driving since the age of seven. I was. I learned to drive on a tractor, a little old Massey Ferguson tractor. And we had to drive because we were on a farm and the first farm we lived on was on a creek. And so we had to move the irrigation pipes all the time. And that was how we usually spent our school holidays in driving the tractor and moving the pipes, which was great because we had water and it was a pretty dry climate. But it meant we also got flooded quite regularly. And us four kids would be in the news every couple of years where we're on the back of the tractor being taken out of the flood water and uh, the family was evacuating and, and us farm kids are just sitting on the, the guard above the big wheel of the tractors to get out, carrying our dogs and cats. And yeah, it was a great thing when it came to getting my license later that I was just so confident as a driver and we bought a bigger farm after that. So I had plenty of driving practice before my time. So when I turned 16, it took me about 30 days to get into my first car accident after getting my license. I'm curious, did you have any major (laughs) mishaps at seven years old when you started driving? No, none at all. We were really, really careful. No mishaps at all. I I got sideswiped by a semi-trailer when I was on my learners, but by then I, I was 17 or almost 17 and the guy was in the wrong and, and it all, all got sorted out. But no, no, none at all. I, uh, my only mishap was about five years ago when I accidentally bumped into the back of a, a guy's ute or utility and uh, that's the only, only mishap I've ever had. No speeding tickets, no, none of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just, just on the road, yeah. And then also I read in your book that you had some pen pals and you were communicating with people through writing? Yes, yes. It's funny when all you All over said, the well, world? Yeah, some in America and England, which seemed all over the world for a farm kid from Australia. And when you asked about the toy, I almost said a raccoon. If you had have forced me to say a, something that was an actual toy, I would have said a raccoon that my pen friend gave to me from America because we don't have raccoons in Australia. And she sent me one and yeah, Charlie was my, my raccoon's name. And yeah, I did. I, I just found, I, I joined pen pal clubs and where they hooked you up through the newspaper with all different pen pals from all over the world. And I loved writing. I, I loved writing letters and, I, and receiving them. What did you learn about yourself or through the world from that experience of being a pen pal? I knew that I wanted to live in a bigger world than just the local area. I knew that I wanted to discover the world a little bit. Yeah. How did you get introduced to that? To the pen pal or to the travel? The pen pal. I think I just used to write to my grandmother and she would write back to me. She was in Sydney, which was about six, seven hours drive away. And yeah, I just loved, loved letter writing. And so got into the kids section of the Sunday newspaper and they advertised something about pen pals and that was it. I was, I think at one stage I had about eight or nine pen pals on the go. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you grew up basically on a working farm in Australia and you decided to become a vegetarian. Yes. Well, the first, <laughs> the first farm was Lucerne and cattle. And then when I was 13, we moved to a larger farm and that was sheep and wheat. 
And what happened on the, the sheep farm is every now and then a butcher would come out from town and all the local farmers would bring a beast over and so they would be killed and cut up and put in the freezer by the end of the day. So I remember at one point hearing the animals over in the yards and thinking their moo and their sound is different today than it is normally. And so I recognised that they were scared and that they were actually, they knew they were going to die. And then at the end of that day, one of my jobs was to write what cut of meat it was, like T-bone or whatever, as we were putting the meat into the plastic bags and the meat was still warm. And then it went into a huge freezer, which supported the family for six months or whatever. So I just remember this really, just how warm the meat was, because until then it had always come out of the freezer or the fridge. It was always cold. And yeah, I, I just couldn't reconcile with that. And and I said to my mum, when I grew up, I'm going to be, on that day, I said, I'm, I'm going to be a vegetarian. And she said, well, that's fine, love, but right now you live here and get on with your job. So it took me a while, but yes, I did eventually go down that road. Absolutely. And you describe yourself in hindsight as being the black sheep of the family. Was that kind of the first time you stepped outside of convention that you remember? No, I was a swimmer as well, and they were all horse riders. And that was probably the most obvious start to it, that... I wanted to go off to swimming training at six in the morning and in the end my mum took me out of swimming and put me on a horse because she couldn't divide her time between all of us and the majority won. All the other three wanted to be on a horse. So I went to pony camps and, you know, I did well. I did, you know, had had a fun time as a kid. You don't really know any different. But now that I'm grown up, I still swim six mornings a week and all of my siblings still ride horses (laughs) and I don't. So... It was always there, the the difference between me and my family. You also became nomadic later on in life, which is something we're going to talk about to kind of solidify the sort of black sheep aspect of what made you different from them. But before we get to that, I wanted to talk about your family dynamic. I know your, your dad had a couple of things he was passionate about. Can you talk a little bit about his occupation and your relationship to that? Sure. Well, my dad was a guitarist, a songwriter and a radio announcer, but he was also an accountant. And my mum was a singer who became a nutritionist, so they met through music. Dad was mum's backup guitarist on a live TV show in in the 50s. But I feel that dad, in hindsight, was really out of his league as a father with four kids. And he quit his music to support mum and because mum had four in five years, four children in five years. And He came home one day and mum was overwhelmed and that was it. He just quit his music except for when his friends visited. So in some ways it was a very structured upbringing, a nine-to-five accountant father background, but then all these hillbillies would turn up for three months a year and it would just turn into like a a mini Nashville. And we, we were at the country music capital of Australia is the town I grew up in. Yeah, but dad was... Dad was quite a broken person and he was a very angry alcoholic and he certainly mellowed in his later years, but I spent most of my childhood really scared, just in terror of being heard, of not daring to speak up because I I learnt somewhere in my, my child mind that the safest way for me to get through childhood was just to stay out of the way and not be noticed. So it was... It was a pretty tricky time, but then I was like him. I was the only one that went into music and I went into banking straight out of school. And so, you know, I I think that the reason my relationship with dad was so fraught with tension was because I was the most like him in the sense that he was really sensitive and really creative, but he had to suppress a lot of that just to manage the family and the farm and, and his work. you see yourself becoming when you were a kid when you were in your teenage years before you started working at the bank how did you see your life sort of unfolding from that point yeah I wanted to be a maths a mathematics teacher maths and PE physical education because I loved sport and I thought I would do that yeah maths maths and PE I didn't really know how many options there were as an adult to choose from that was from my reality as a child it was like okay well 
I loved school. I love numbers. I love sport. So I'll just be a teacher for all that. And did your dad teach you about songwriting or anything when you were a kid? He got all four of us a guitar each at one stage. I don't know if he borrowed them all because I don't remember them being around afterwards, but he gave us one lesson and then just said, no, nah, this, is, this is a waste of, <laughs> waste of bloody time. So, um, no, I, I didn't write my first song till I was 35. I mm. found my way really slowly to my music journey and, yeah, and, and, and he got a little bit involved then after he sort of got through his own resistance to me writing songs. But no, not at all. Dad was pretty closed unless his music friends were around and then he was usually happy drunk and so then we were invited to sing along and stuff like that. But the rest of the time, no, Dad didn't really share much of himself in that way. And then so after high school, you go to this local bank, you tell them, hey, I want to work at your bank, but in Sydney, and they hired you. What do you think (laughs) they saw in you when you went in there and propositioned them? Well, I'd held down two jobs while I was at school, so I'd already shown that I was reliable, though one of those jobs was a money handling job and a cashier's job. And I don't know, I think they just saw that it was easy, that I'd, I had the initiative to go in there. I had a grandmother in Sydney who I could live with, so they got me a job in the next suburb to where my grandma was within two weeks of finishing school. <laughs> I don't know, like, I think it was just... That steadiness as a kid, I had a bit of common sense and I pretty much had it all worked out for them. So well, you had been driving to... for 12 years at that point, so you had yes. that confidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in a gentle way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then how was the banking industry for you? Oh, it was okay. I got off the rails a little bit after that because I, I had freedom for the first time ever and I had a lot of city friends and city kids grow up a lot faster than country kids so I was trying to catch up to them a little bit and I ended up in a relationship with a guy 10 years older than me within six months of leaving home and you were engaged yeah yeah I I actually married him I didn't mention that in the book I just didn't get around to it but yeah I was I was um (laughs) you know girls got to have some secrets at some point (laughs) yeah so I was with a mortgage and married at 20 and divorced a few years later. So it was interesting because if I wasn't going to be a maths and PE teacher, my other alternative career that I had considered was to join the mounted police force with the horses and be in the police force. But my first husband was actually a pot grower and dope dealer. So I went from this really sort of good intention to bagging up his pot for him and stuff even though I wasn't smoking it it was just like such a different reality from my sweet intentions well you also had that night of the speed nearly overdose or something like that you talked about in the book was that around that time as well no I hadn't woken up by then that was about 10 years later oh wow okay okay so you were in it you're in it for a little while yeah I was on self-destruct but self-destruct but with an element of responsibility all the way through for a good while. I, I had a lot of healing to do, a lot of, of mm-hmm. healing to do around my my self-worth and the scars I took out of my childhood. And, yeah, so that awful incident I speak about in the book was, was when I was in London and that was in my 30s. When did you recognise that banking, that your heart wasn't into what you were doing and that that was something that was important to you? Not until I was almost 30. So I was in banking for a long time, but I changed jobs within the banks and I ended up moving around a lot. And as a result of that, I sort of had quite an accelerated career path because I I would just go to a new town, relocate and go to a bank and, and they'd say, oh, well, we've got this job. And I'd say, oh, yeah, I could do, I could do that one. I've done this and this. And, and so I just kept putting myself up higher and higher and learning how to do the jobs on the go. And... I had this theory in my 20s that it didn't matter whether work was happy or not as long as I was having fun outside of work. But then around 29, 30, that shifted and I just thought, I can't do this work anymore. I need a job with heart and I don't want to wear makeup to work. I don't want to wear stockings and high heels. I just want to be me. And yeah, so it it took a while and then it took another few years to actually make those changes. Talk about the importance of the inspiration factory during that time and how that played a role in kind of moving the story forward? 
Yes, yeah, so I was living in Perth, which is the most isolated city in the world and the third windiest, just as a bit of <laughs> trivia. <laughs> and a really great place with amazing sunsets on the water. And I was travelling into the city on a train every day and I came across this bookstore called The Inspiration Factory. And so every week I went there and bought a book and read that book and went back the next week. And so and they're all inspirational, personal growth, self-help. And it was before the internet was really kicking in as well. And it was just such a positive place to be. It was operated by a, a gorgeous woman called Jennifer, who was miles ahead of her years. And yeah, those books just started helping me believe that I could actually be more than I was and that it wasn't just airy fairy stuff. It was like, actually, I don't have to be what my family have said I am and that's that I would never amount to anything and that I'm sort of not deserving of, of stuff, of good, goodness. And, yeah, so it, it was a massive year of transformation and it was all thanks to the Inspiration Factory. And even when you'd buy a book, they'd put a quote inside as a bookmark and there was a, a quote there, I think it was from Josie Bissett, and it said, dreams come in a size too big so you can grow into them. And mm. it really stayed with me and helped me then whenever I get frustrated, I just think, okay, my dreams are a size too big for me. I'm just growing into them. And, you know, it helped me, me realise that good things take time and to realise that you can actually grow into your dreams. They're not just unattainable ideas that you have. You can achieve them, but you have to grow into them. Yeah. What were some of the most influential books that you remember reading at the time that really left an impression on you? I think the most powerful in that time was Creative Visualisation by Shakti Gawain. I was sitting down by the river in Perth and you had to make a list of five things you liked and five things that you were good at. And the only things that sort of fell in both columns for me was photography and writing and numbers. And I thought, okay, well, I've been working with numbers in a bank and I'm still not happy. So dare I think I could actually be a creative person and it was such a, an awakening because I just done the traditional path my my parents were Monday to Friday nine to fivers and I'd gone down that road and totally forgot that they were hugely creative people and yeah I just sort of thought could I actually be an artistic type of person <laughs> maybe I'm an artistic type of person <laughs> and it was it was huge for me like oh my goodness that's a world I, I've never considered I might be a part of and from then on the journey really began then because I had to undo all my old expectations or my old conditioning and just find the courage to keep going one step at a time and find my way into that world and to find a way to support myself in it. Were you meditating at the time? I was meditating but not with Vipassana which became my path later. I was doing guided meditations through Oh, my goodness, I can't remember who. But I can even see the tape covers. They're on tapes, on, yeah, on, on cassettes. Oh, Sinea Roman, Sinea Roman. I was doing meditation then. That was when I started it all, and that was from the Inspiration Factory as well. You weren't married at the time. You were kind of on your own. No, I was with a new man that I'd brought back from England with me. Yeah. Got it. So you'd already yeah. done the trip to England at that point? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's rewind a little bit. And talk, yeah, and talk sorry, about yeah, I sort of don't share. So you too. took a, you you took a sabbatical from banking and you went to. Did you go on your bush trip first, or did you go to England first? A bush trip, as in the long walk that I did. Yeah, the walk and the nomading and and living in yeah, the jeep and sorry, all of that. The, yeah, sorry, the book's not as chronological in my memory <laughs> okay. as the patients were because I right. used the stories in the book that were relevant to the lesson I was learning through. Yes, I've got you there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's fill in that gap a little bit. Okay, so you, the you, walk you left was years banking. later. Yeah the, yeah, the walk was years later. Yeah. Okay, so the trip to England was before that, where yeah, you worked so, with Agnes. Yes, yeah, so I was in banking for a long time. Then I went and lived on an island for a couple of years. Then I went over and lived in England for a few years. Yep. And then I came back and lived in Perth. So, yeah, where I had that awakening. So you'd already had that experience then of being a live-in companion 
by the time you were in Perth and going to the Inspiration Factory and yes. all of that. Yes, yes, I, I had, but I still fell back into banking as soon as I got back to Australia. Even though I'd worked mm. as a carer overseas, I just saw that as a travel job. I didn't realise that it was a seed had been planted and it was going to actually lead me into a whole new career. So when I came back to Australia, I had another couple of years temping in the banking industry and then I just realised I couldn't do this and and so life called me back to be a carer again. But, yeah, in England I was a living carer. Is that when you first went to Ruth after? Was, was she your first palliative care client? Ruth was my first one, yeah. That was, okay. that was in, when I was back in Australia, yep. Got it. And is that the one where you had to tell the white lie About... to get the job? About the oh, fact yeah. that you had experience? Yes. Because you, you yeah. kind of made a big deal about that in the book. And I, I really related to that because, you know, that's something I think people who are passionate about something, you know, you're going into a new field, you want to put yourself in the best position. You're getting told by someone with experience, hey, it's not a big deal if you just say, say you know what you're doing. But you, you kind of grapple with that for, a, little, mm. for a, lot, a lot, actually. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, so it was actually my second patient I lied to the family about because Mm -hmm. the first one was just a live-in companion job that turned into palliative care. So I was qualified for that. But it was the second family and they asked me how long I'd been doing the work and just really trusted me with their mum, that was Stella. And the agency that I was working for had sent me into this job and said, don't tell them you've only had one client. Just tell them you've been with us for years. You're really good at this. You know what you're doing. Just just go in there and ring us if you've got any problems. And I was like, uh, okay. So, yeah, the family were just lovely and they had so much trust in me that I I felt very guilty about lying to them. And I came clean years later to them because I stayed in touch. But, yeah, I, I hated it. I hated that I'd lied even though I was doing the job I was being paid for. They were getting the service that they were paying for and and more because I got on so well with their mum and she was a meditator and a yoga teacher. And, yeah, but I just, it just didn't sit easy with me because I just think that as hard as honesty is, it really is the only way to be. And so it, it really went against my values, but I was so desperate for work and felt such a calling to be in this field and wanted to stay in it that I was worried that if, If I didn't go along with what my boss had said, then I may not actually have any work. I'm curious, looking back at that moment now, as someone who's had so much life experience, would you make the same choice to lie? Mm, Good question. Possibly. Yeah, possibly. Because I felt such a strong calling to be in that work. It had taken me by surprise to be in palliative care with my first living companion in Australia when that turned into a a terminal case. But during that experience, I felt such a strong calling that, oh, okay, this is actually the job I've been asking for. I wanted a job with heart where I could just be myself, no makeup, no high heels, all that. And I realised that I'd been given that. So, yeah, I I think because I wasn't qualified and I I had such an affinity with the role that I didn't want to waste my time leaving the role to go and study and then come back to it. I wanted to stay in it. And you said Ruth was not set up initially to be a palliative care situation, but then she ended up transitioning. And that was the first time you'd seen someone do that, correct? Yes. Yes. And so then Stella had her experience and when she transitioned, and something happened right at that moment that you kind of surprised you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, she'd been unconscious, like in a, in a coma for at least, I came in in the morning at eight in the morning and she'd already been in that space before I left at eight o'clock the night before. So at least 12 hours, but, but close to probably to about 16 or 20. But yeah, and I was just holding her hand Oh, actually, I wasn't. I was holding her foot because her two, her husband and her son were holding her hands, but they wanted me in the room. And so I was just had my hand on her foot. And then she'd had no response at all when we spoke with her, nothing at all. And then she just opened her eyes and looked up in sort of the corner where the wall and the ceiling joined. So I looked up to the ceiling and just had the most incredibly beautiful, radiant smile. And 
a look of recognition, like she recognised someone there and she was like, <gasps> and, and she'd gone from this being in a coma and, and to that and, and all of us were, the three of us were just like, oh, you know, what's going on here? And she just looked for, for a minute or two, just a moment or two, and then just closed, her, just went, oh, and closed her eyes and then that was it. She had died and I didn't know because I'd only been around one dying person before her and that was a very different exit. She was, Ruth was very obviously dying when she was, her soul left her body. But with Stella, it was so gentle. And so then her husband and the son are looking at me saying, is she dead? Is she dead? And I'm, my heart's beating out through my chest and I'm trying to feel a pulse and I didn't really know where to, where the pulse Wait, you're holding was. the foot trying to feel the pulse. No, I let go by then. I was standing up and I've got my hand under her neck and I'm feeling her wrist and, and all I could feel was my heart going, boom, 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 you know, because it's like, what's going on here? And, uh, and yeah, I, I just didn't know. And then I just said to Stella, because we'd had such a spiritual connection, I just said, are you gone, honey? And I just got the feeling, yeah, I'm, I'm gone. And so then I said to the family, yes, yeah, she's gone. And she was. That was it. She was, she was gone, yeah. And you've been reading all these spiritual books, right, for all these years and studying this stuff and meditating. What did you take away from that experience when you saw that happen? Oh, just how wrong we've got it in denying death and in being scared of death. Because wherever she was going or whatever she was seeing, I wanted a piece of that cake. She was so incredibly radiant and joyful, just absolutely overflowing with joy in that moment that I just thought, okay, well, it's not where we go to, it's where we return to. Yeah. I, I heard one guru say something really profound. He said, if you really knew what was happening, you would mourn when someone was born and you would rejoice when they died. That makes so much sense, yes. Yeah, because life is so hard compared to the look. <laughs> it can be as the human experience. And then when I saw where Stella was going, it just, I've never been scared of death since. No matter how many people I looked after following her, I've never been scared of death ever because it's like, wow, you know, this is beautiful and loving and it's all going to be fine. And talk about Grace, your client Grace, and what was the big learning from that experience? Grace was only a, a really small woman, like really tiny, but we connected very strongly straight away. She reminded me a little bit of my grandmother who'd also been a tiny woman. But Grace had been married to the same man for over 50 years and in her words, he was a tyrant. And she had wanted to go travelling and he didn't want to do any of that and she just dedicated her life to him without doing anything that she wanted to do ever. And that's what it was like in those days. She was from an older generation and you'd never leave your husband. What would the neighbours think? Yeah, and then when he got really ill and went into a nursing home and so she started looking at travel brochures. She wanted to do some bus tours just to see a bit more of Australia. She was all set to go. I think she was 86 at the time with a really good spirit because she was finally free for the first time in her adult life. But within three weeks of him going into the nursing home, she became ill and it turned out to be stage four lung cancer. And she'd never been a smoker, but he smoked in the house all that time. So Grace had huge anguish and regret around the life she had led and really opened my eyes up to how painful regrets are at the end of, of your life. And yeah, she, I was trying to become a singer-songwriter then and it was really hard. I didn't have a lot of confidence but I wanted to get my message out there and Grace held my hand really tightly one day and said to me, promise me, Bronnie, promise this dying woman that you will always live the life you want to live, not the life that others expect of you. You know, don't make the same mistakes as me and she was crying at the time and I, I was crying with her and and it was a, a massive turning point for me because it was the first time of many that would come, that would follow, but it was f the first time I'd seen firsthand the pain and anguish of regrets on your deathbed. And I thought, I don't care how hard it's going to be to live the life that's true to my heart, it's never going to be as hard as getting to my deathbed with regrets. Mm -hmm. And 
yeah, it, it just gave me so much courage and still does because I am not going to be in that position. So, yeah, she played a huge role in my life, bless her. And so three things are happening in the background as far as the book is concerned. Maybe the chronolog- it's off chronologically, but you were keeping a gratitude journal at the time. Yes, yes. So were you recording all of these things and obviously framing them in the context of gratitude, but it sounded like later on in your story, you were able to kind of reflect back on some of these takeaways that you were experiencing with your various clients through that journal, unless there was a separate journal. Uh, there number were two. two. Yeah. Okay. And then number two, you were performing, you started performing your songs because you wanted them to get out there and you realized the only way they're going to get out there is if somebody sings them and the only person who's going to sing them right now is me, but I'm not a great singer, but I'm going to do it anyway because that's what I'm being called to do. And number three, you had tried to publish a photography book. So am I correct? Were all those things Mm. happening around the same time? Yes, yes. So the journal, one was a gratitude journal and one was just a regular sort my head out journal. And that's why I have such clear memories of my time because my patients were asleep so much that, and I had to be in the room with them. So I was either reading or writing in journals. And I kept doing the singer-songwriter thing because the pain of going back to banking and being in the wrong work drove me forward, but also witnessing Grace's regrets helped me see, okay, I have a message to share. I have to find a way to do that. And the photography book, after all the inspiration from the Inspiration Factory, I'd done a lot of work realising, okay, what am I good at? And that was photography, nature photography and, and writing quotes. And this was before the internet. And so I had put it all together into a little gift book and I had been trying to get that published. And After a couple of years, I was so dedicated. I just kept going and I had to print off a colour copy every time. And it was a massive thing. And rejection letters came as paper and envelopes. And my rejection pile was probably about three inches high. And it was the frustration of that that made me pick up the guitar and start writing my first song. And then I thought, oh, okay, this might actually make more sense because my parents were musicians. This is actually in my genes. I know nothing about the publishing industry maybe I'm meant to be a singer-songwriter instead. And so I did. I just kept putting myself out there all around the open mic nights and the singer-songwriter nights until I started getting into festivals and, and that sort of thing. And But I can't say I honestly ever really look forward to any gig I do. Yeah. <laughs> What was your mindset at the time? Were you very optimistic about things or were you just kind of feeling like you were in a process of following your heart and that the outcome wasn't even important? The outcome was important because the calling to share my message was so strong. But I, I was meditating by then and I was going through some really big healing. And to be honest, it was just a really hard chapter of my life. I was supporting all these families and dying people but I had no support myself by then. I'd left the relationship with the guy from England as well. And so I was on my own and just really just very in so much emotional pain and with some very big big walls around myself. I felt very isolated in life. And that's probably why I was such a good carer because I had a lot of love to give and I wasn't sharing it elsewhere. And I felt safe with my patients because when you're at the end of your life, there's really not much time left for nonsense in conversation. And so all of our conversations were really deep and beautiful. So I don't know, Light. It was a strange old time. And I've always been very, very good at finding the blessings in disguise. I do think that's one of my strengths. So even when I'm going through a very hard time, I'm always determined to pull the lesson from it and pull the the learning from it. So Yeah, I was in that sort of place where I was just doing the best I could and loving my patients as fully as I I was able. So just for clarification purposes, were you a singer-songwriter moonlighting as a palliative care worker or were you a palliative care worker moonlighting as a (laughs) singer-songwriter? Well, I'd probably say palliative care moonlighting as a singer-songwriter because palliative care... You can't... It's not fair to revise history, by the way. I want you to answer that question from where you were at the time well in my mind palliative care was paying me 
Mm-hmm. So I would have called myself a palliative carer who was trying to become a singer-songwriter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and then you got sick and you healed yourself, which I thought was really fascinating because you didn't opt for the surgery that was recommended. Mm. And you, you apparently use fasting and visualization and all of that. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and what yeah, you learned so from it? I didn't write in the book what it was because I didn't want to become an advocate for the situation because back then I, was, I had so much fear around becoming a public person anyway. And we're all on such different journeys with our health. So I had a melanoma on my leg and I had nurse people with skin cancer who died. And so I didn't want to say in the book, I healed myself of melanoma because I can't be responsible for what other people have done. And I've since been on a, a whole different healing journey with my health and haven't healed that completely. So, you know, we're, we've all got a different, a different path to go on. But I came across this book and it's called Cell Level Healing by Joyce Whiteley Hawks and it had a, a huge effect on me. And so I'd had a melanoma removed and the skin specialist said, the surgeon said I had to have a skin graft and have more work done. And so I just sat with it and asked my body, was it all gone or wasn't it? And what did I want? And I'd, I'd also, because I'm very fair skinned and I'd already had a lot of sunspots burn off and different things going on. And I felt like I was getting a little bit sick of damage to my skin. And I'd also ridden my bike into a barbed wire fence as a kid and, you know, got a scooter scar somewhere else. So, you know, there's a few scars on, on my body. And yeah, so I, I didn't, I chose not to go ahead with surgery. And so I went on a fast and just shut out the world and went into some really deep meditative spaces for it. And I'd been fasting for a few days and then I just had this urgency to purge and I'd, I'd been meditating for a few hours, just uh, just sitting in silence for a few hours and doing these meditations that, that I learned from this book, Cell Level Healing, and asking my cells to eradicate my body from any cells that were not beneficial to my body. And then I just had to run, run to the toilet and, and vomited full on into it. And it's amazing how much stuff is stored in the digestive system and within our body because I was there for a good few hours just vomiting and then just sitting there, then a little bit more. And it was the, the deepest purge I've, I've ever done. And after that, I just knew that, that it was gone and I've never had any problem at all with that scar where the melanoma was and you know that's over 20 years ago now so it was a pretty amazing time was that something you advertised at the time because i can imagine it can be a little bit bewildering to certain people especially with your family and stuff like that oh no i don't think they even know it now (laughs) (laughs) i know the feeling yeah, my mum would because I share everything with her. But no, my <laughs> siblings are just living their own lives. And, yeah. No, no, I didn't advertise it to anyone. It was a very solitary thing. It was, it was between me and my body. And I shared it with a couple of friends who really believed in me. But it's a, it's a hard thing to share because obviously people are going to project their fear onto you. Even if they love you, they're sort of like, oh, okay, you know, and I couldn't risk that. I couldn't risk taking on anyone's fear. I had enough to deal with through my own, not through my own fear, but worried about their fear disconnecting me from my faith and from my knowing that, that I'd made the right choice. So, no, it was just really just between me and God. What were you say was guiding you around that time? Was it the meditation or was it something else? Yeah, meditation had become a huge part of my life then. So, yeah, that's what it was. It was meditation was, had just taken me so far inward that I now trusted what was the wisdom that came from within miles more than I, I would from any outside advice. And that's, you know, that's a, a, a wonderful freedom, but it's also a big responsibility because you've got to make your own decisions. And speaking of that, You have another wonderful story that I would love to hear about with your first album coming to fruition and how your friend Leanne kind of 
how that all came together. Can you just touch on that a little bit? Because I think it's really cool to hear how that trust and the intuition kind of plays out. For sure. I knew it was time to record my first album. Everything in me said, yep, go and do it. And I had all my musicians lined up and everything else, but I didn't have any money to do it. I had hardly any money to do it. It's certainly not enough to to record it, but it was just such a strong guidance within me, just like, yes, do, do it. So I just started getting organised and got everyone in place, and that included my producer, who was also my guitarist, and he was a married man with two kids. He had big financial responsibilities and time responsibilities and and then it got up to, I went away on a little singing camp for a couple of days in anticipation and we were due to start on the Monday. I was moving into a house, uh, my favourite house sit, and I was house sitting a lot then, into my favourite house sit that weekend. But on the Friday before we were due to start, I still didn't have the money and I was $5,000 short, which is a lot of money to come up with out of the blue. And I started, it had been building for about a week, like, okay, I've followed this, I've honoured this, but I am getting really, really scared here because I've got to pay this guy and I've got to pay all the other musicians and what am I going to do? And so on the Friday evening I went and sat on my meditation cushion in a panic really, just in such a panic thinking what am I going to do? I was really scared, very, very scared. And so I meditated and just said, you know, I'm really scared here, I don't know what to do. And, And I just got, let it go. Just let it go. Go out and have a, just forget about it for tonight. Go out and have a good night. And so I went out with, with a mate and I was going, I had planned to go and see a band and I was on my own, going to do it on my own. And then a friend got in touch and said she wanted to go to this bookshop that has a cafe and how about we go there? I said, yeah, sure, let's do that. So it felt like a, a good distraction from my own head to be with someone else. And then she ran into another friend of hers and while my mate was like our mutual friend was off looking at the books, I sat down with, with her friend and we just got chatting and she said, you know, tell me about your life. Um, my life's really awful. It's crap at the moment. That's what she said. My life's crap. Tell me about your life right now. And I said, well, actually my life's pretty crap too right now. I said, I'm waiting on a miracle and I'm, I'm right at the 11th hour and I'm really scared and I don't know what I'm going to do. So tell me about your life instead. And she said, no, no, I want to hear about yours. Tell me what, what is all this about? And so I just said, well, I'm due to start recording my album on Monday and I don't have any money and I'm, you know, I need at least $5,000 and I'm really scared and I don't know what to do, but I just felt my heart just said to do this and get on with it. And she said, well, my life is crap because I'm going through a really shocking divorce and I've wanted to support the arts for years and my husband wouldn't let me support the arts, so I'm going to use the money I'm getting from him to support the arts. I'm going to turn up on Monday morning at your house with $5,000 in cash. (laughs) And And she did. Yeah, I just burst into tears, of course, and... And I just thought to myself, how do we ever question it? Because we don't need it before we need it. And I got it when I needed it. But we always think we need it before that. And I'd had little leaps of faith prior to that time. And I'd always landed on my feet. Someone, you know, there was always a solution was presented at the the last minute. But because this one was so large and involved so many other people, it just seemed huge. But it just taught me that, we only think we need the money a month before or a week before or whatever because it's for our own security. But life just knows that it'll come if you get out of the way. I'm trying to give it to you, but get out of the way. And so, yeah, she turned up and she she just said, I just want to have my name on the album cover as the executive producer. So I said, sure. And she just came in, didn't want to get involved, just lay on the floor on the the thick lush carpet of this house and just sat there while we started recording the album and came to the launch and yeah it was it didn't stay in touch or anything was just quite detached from the whole process but was a, a guardian you know was, was an angel yeah was this when you were still doing the palliative care or was what, what, yes. did the album come out then so how, how did yes. how did it go it was okay I wasn't really confident it was the start of me trying to back myself and I'm really proud of what I put out there considering how vulnerable and broken I was at the time. 
it was well received. A couple of the songs got a little bit of airplay in Australia and I got into some folk festivals to play at, just small folk festivals. But I never really made it hugely in Australia. And my heart was just, I hated going to gigs at 10 o'clock at night and playing in pubs. And yeah, it, it was a hard road, but my music was, was such a joy to me besides that aspect of it. Yeah. You told this story in your book about, well, you just gave a kind of metaphor for the typical drunk Aussie guy who would come up in front of you on stage and pretend like he was God's gift to women. And you went through this whole thing. It was really funny. I just wanted to put that out there. Did you feel like you were living your purpose at the time when you were doing the palliative care and and the music and the trying to do the photography and all of that? How closely were you aligned with what you felt was your purpose? I felt I was because I was honoring my creative talents and I was making a difference in the world in a way that wasn't selling insurance to people in the bank. Mm. (laughs) As long as it wasn't anything to do with banking. Yeah, I did. I I felt like I was on the right path and I was meditating two hours a day, an hour morning and afternoon, and I was very, very connected to my inner guidance. But I, um, I had no idea that I would be called onto the author's path and I am so grateful for that that I could get my message out there in a way that's much more suitable to my quiet nature than playing in really loud pubs. Yeah. And at the time you kind of, I guess, saw yourself just, I'm going to be house sitting and nomading and, you know, taking up little jobs here and taking a little time off in between clients to reboot and trying to do some creative pursuits here and there. That's, that's kind of what you saw for yourself for the next foreseeable future. Yes. Yeah. I, a friend, my cousin's friend who I used to play music with a bit, he said to me one night, well, you've got to settle down sometime, Bronnie. And I said, do I? Why? And he said, well, everyone does. And I said, no, not everyone does. And he said, okay, tell me then, where would you like to be when you're 50? And I think I was about 30 at the time, you know, where would you like to be? I said, oh, I'd love to own a motor home. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I did actually find a settled bone in my body years later. But, yeah, Yeah. that was where I was at back then, Light. I was just just drifting and letting life take me wherever it wanted to go. Well, you eventually graduated yourself from the palliative care work and you've got yourself settled into a cottage. And that was another great story. We don't have to get into that because there's so many great stories. But you got all this secondhand furniture. It was like timed perfectly without trying to time it. And it just all kind of came together. And that's right at the beginning of the sort of songwriting in prison, the women's prisons endeavor for which you had zero experience teaching people. You had no budget. And how did that all come together? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I just got this really absurd idea one day when I was with a patient that I wanted to teach songwriting in a jail. And that's so random. I know. I know. I'd never been inside a jail in my life. I knew no one who'd been inside a jail. I have no idea what that was about. But the only thing I could put it down to was I wanted to work where there was some hope. And so at least if I was helping people in jail, they could have some hope to improve their life. I'm not sure. I I, I really don't know. It was just a guided thing. And so through one of my patient's friends, I ended up finding some funding for a jail. It took about a year or so, but she had said to me, because this patient was a really hard work and a very authoritarian woman and she'd been, she was just really hard work. And and so her friend said to me, I've seen how you look after her. If you can do that, you can do anything. I'll help you find the funding. And I said, okay, great, thank you. So we had to find like an auspice organisation, charity organisation to fund the donations through the philanthropic grant that I got so yeah I taught in a jail I went to a jail and said that I'd like to set up a songwriting program and that I was working on finding some funding and they said sure that sounds fine because to them I was a volunteer so I was offering something for nothing to them and I was supposed to have all this security training and everything else I found out six months into the job but but I hadn't and one day someone said how come you've got your handbag with you, one in the staff area? And I said, well, I'm just going to put it in the locker. And they said, yeah, but you can't bring a handbag in. And I said, why not? I I have every week for the last six months. And and they said, you have to empty your contents and put them in a plastic bag so they can be seen. And I said, oh, no one's ever stopped me. And they said, okay. So there were all these loopholes that 
the doors just opened for me and which was sort of good because I had actually snuck in a couple of CDs for them, for the, the students, you know, because they needed some music. So. <laughs> yeah, so I taught songwriting for healing to a beautiful group of women and it was then that I actually realised how much I needed to be looked after myself because mm. they gave me so much love. I thought I was there helping them and I was in teaching them how to play the guitar and how to write basic songs. But I guess they were just, they were just sensitive, good-hearted women who got lost along the way. And I received so much love and genuine care from them that they were healing me as much as I was healing them. So it was a really unexpected time, to be honest, yeah. And you had a bit of a dark night of the soul moment mm, a little bit after that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, suicidal so, thoughts and depression yeah the works yeah once the funding ran out from the jail I, my energy was just getting lower and lower and some new neighbors had moved in next door to the cottage i was living in and they were fighting all the time so it wasn't a nice home environment either and so i just had this calling to move back to the country and i hadn't lived in a rural area for years like 25 27 years or something and so i rented this house on a cattle farm a vegan on a cattle farm and it was right by a creek and it was beautiful. And I just thought I'll just have a little break. I had a little bit of savings. I thought I'll have a break for a month or so, then I'll start looking for some sort of work. And during that time, I just, it was just like someone unplugged me from the wall and I just fell into a dark pit. I just had no energy to do anything and ended up in a really huge time of suicidal depression where I just felt like all the work I'd done on myself and all the acts of courage I'd taken and all the decisions I'd done that was honouring my heart was, and I still hadn't got, I felt like I hadn't got anywhere. I was like, okay, well, I'm still here. I'm still in pain, emotional pain. I'm still financially not strong. I'm still not knowing where I belong. And yeah, and so it got really bad, shockingly bad. But I found an amazing counsellor and counselling in those days wasn't as big in Australia as it is in, in the States. And so it was quite a, something I, you know, I wouldn't tell anyone I was having counselling. It was that sort of stigma in those days. And she was just brilliant. She just said, what are you doing? You're trying to go for a gold medal in the Carers Olympics, you know, and you've got to look after yourself. And she just helped me amazingly. But in the end, I did just reach a breaking point where I thought I can't live with this anymore. And I tried to write my farewell letter, which was really just to my mum in apology and I was I worked out this road I was going to drive off and I owned a van so I was right at the, the windscreen you know you sit right at the front of a van so I, I was all set to do it and in tears and trying to write this scribble this letter but I was just so distraught that that I couldn't write it properly and then the phone rang and I, I don't know why I picked it up because I normally don't pick up unanswered like numbers I didn't know I'd let it go to the message bank and uh and it was just this really chirpy voice hello is that Bronnie and I'm like yeah who's this <laughs> and she said, I can't remember her name but you know it's so and so and it was she was from a, a health insurance thing offering me ambulance insurance and my number was silent I hadn't given it out to anyone I'd protected it for years I'd always sort of been really private in in my personal details and yeah, and here's this woman just ringing out of the blue and reminding me that, oh, I might not actually succeed in killing myself. I might actually need an ambulance and be even worse off. Mm. And, yeah, then I just thought, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I just like, no, I don't want any, I don't want any ambulance insurance things. And just sat there <laughs> I'm not going to need it anymore. No, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. I have a question about this experience. So you also mentioned that there was a friend of yours that would call you and he'd say funny stuff like, you should better not be killing yourself right now. Yes. Is there anything that anyone could have done to help you get through that period, looking back on it now, or maybe even thinking about how you were, where you were at the time? Because I know a lot, of, I just had a friend commit suicide recently mm -hmm. and I was in touch with him. And I knew he was having suicidal thoughts. And I'm just curious from that vantage point when you're in it, is it about people calling you more? Is there anything people can do to kind of help? Or is it just a lost cause? 
and I'm, obviously there are exceptions and everyone's thing is yeah. different, but just I'm wondering what your experience was. Well, you, you can't escape yourself. So it doesn't matter how much support you might get from externally, you still have to deal with, with the internals. But meditation is probably what saved me during the day. I would still somehow sit and still have that sense of connection with divinity and think, okay, you know, there's, there's still love somewhere within me. But I think that the greatest thing we can do for anyone with depression is accept where they're at and not try to fix them because that puts a lot of pressure on people and we are naturally good people. The humanity is naturally good and wants to support each other and we do naturally care for each other and underneath all the other fear and nonsense, but we are naturally good instinctively. And it's so easy to just want to fix people, but I think that acceptance is probably the thing that actually was the greatest act of love that I received because it, it made me feel, okay, I've got support there, but I've got support no matter what. And I don't have to pretend to be better today. And I don't have to take their advice. And, you know, a lot of friends dropped away because they just couldn't handle me. I, I was in that space for about six months. And, but those that stayed were just, they weren't trying to fix me. They were just like, well, how are you today? And I'd say, well, I'm, you know, I can't swear and <laughs> so, you know, I'm not so good. <laughs> but then they wouldn't sort of say, you've got to get out and meet more people or why don't you try this or try that because they knew me well enough to know I was giving it my best shot to heal as it was. And I think I just had to be, and I think at some point all of us have to be cracked open and that's how it came for me, that it, it cracked me open through depression after giving for so many years and, and not receiving. And and if we're trying to distract people from that lesson, I mean, some people like your friend won't come back from it and they will take their life. But there's a lot of people who would go through depression that if they were given acceptance and the right environment to heal, eventually they would actually come through it and think, yeah, okay, I'm starting to come through this. Life's feeling a little bit, just a, you know, a millimetre lighter today. And the next day, oh, it's okay, I'm feeling a little bit lighter. And eventually, it's not, a, it's not an overnight thing, but you do, yeah, there, there is a, a turning point. I got a sense from your book that the depression for you just kind of lifted. Was it more of a gradual process than what you articulated in the book? No, I mean, it did lift. It, it lifted like the actual, like, suicidal thoughts the the doom the heaviness that did lift for me absolutely it lifted but what i mean is like this it was still a gradual process to get back into life got to it find, to find my way back into being capable of of working and so it was just like each day like okay i'm feeling a little bit more capable today today i can i can do this you know i could drive to town and have a conversation with their shop assistant or or whatever but yeah, it, my life transformed really quickly and, and that's when my, my blog took off straight almost immediately following that where I just said, okay, I'm coming through, I'm through the worst of it. The, the ambulance time was the turning point and I knew then, okay, I'm not going to kill myself. I've got to that point where I was that close to doing it. I want to value the gift of my life now. Show me how to live in a different way. And so that's how the cloud sort of, lifted and, and my eyes were open to new colors and it was like the whole farm was illuminated like I'd come off some really like I'd been in a 20-day silent retreat or something and everything all my senses were heightened and yeah it, it was it was pretty phenomenal for me how it all happened. So you'd already started Inspiration and Chai at that point? Yes I started that when I was teaching in the jail so I'd been writing okay. it all all the way through a lot of those articles aren't on the blog anymore, but yeah, I was still writing at least every, every couple of weeks for it, but I wasn't writing about me going through depression. I was writing mm -hmm. about beautiful things that were happening in nature and using that as a tool for teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And talk about writing the top five regrets. What inspired that article at the time that you actually sat down and wrote it? Why that okay. day? Yeah. It was while I was in the jail and I'd, I'd come back from a really awful gig and I just didn't want to do any more gigs. And a music magazine had asked me to write an article about teaching in the jail. 
So I did that and then I wrote that for them. And then I thought, why aren't I writing more? I love writing, not just songwriting. You know, I love writing. I'll start a blog. And so, and I'd just been to some seminar thing that they were saying how to make money, you know, from being online. And one of those people was a blogger. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll start a blog and I could make money from that somehow. Yeah, so I just thought, what do I write about? And I even Googled good blog topics. But instead, you know, my guidance inside just said, write what you know. And I thought, okay, well, I've just finished working with the dying people. Their regrets shaped my life, transformed my life over the last eight years. I'm going to write about their regrets because that's what that was my biggest takeaway from all those years was how painful regrets are at the end. And so I just sat down and wrote it because I'd been mastering it and recognising what the regrets were for eight years and I put it on my blog while I was teaching in the jail. Then I went through this whole time of depression and, and suicidal thoughts and then as I came out of that, as I was taking one step back and then the next step back, then the blog just took off and then I was offered a, a deal with an agent to get the book published and so, you know, she just said, do you want to write a book? And I said, yeah, everyone's got a book in them. And I said, I could only write this book if I wrote it as a memoir because death is so unrelatable to living people. And so I knew that if I wrote it as a transformation of my own life, then people would connect with that and death would become a bit more relatable through my my exposure to it. Yeah, so I signed to her, then it was rejected by 25 publishers. So I was released and so I put it out myself and then... um, By then I was in a new relationship and I was pregnant and then in the same 24 hours as my daughter was born, my my dream publishing house offered me a publishing deal and then it became their fastest foreign rights seller in history, in Hay House history. So it's now in 32 languages with with a movie in the pipeline and so we don't know, we don't know the seeds that that we sow when we sow them because that was in the cottage near the jail when I wrote that article and I still had to go through that massive healing process and what that did was it cracked me open and helped me let go of so much nonsense that had been holding me back and yeah it's sort of I have one question about your process when you were writing that article because you know as a writer you've been writing for decades right every time you sat down you wrote in your gratitude journal you wrote in your regular journal you're telling these stories you're remembering these things there must not have been anything different about that particular day and that particular post. And maybe before that you were only getting, I don't know, 30 people looking at your blog or something like that. When you were writing it out, the five regrets, did it come out as five regrets or did it come out, you just kind of listed all of the regrets and you said, well, let me consolidate these into five different things. Like, did you already have that narrative in your consciousness before and you sat down and just wrote it out or did it just kind of, were you channeling it kind of like Neil Donald Walsh and his, his conversations with God experience? Like what was that process like? Well, I'd just been to this seminar about blogging and they had said, make sure you have good titles, top five, top 10, top whatever. <laughs> right. And so that's how that came about. Though initially I didn't even call it the top five regrets of the dying. I just called it regrets of the dying. And so I had already recognised five themes. That had already happened naturally, that there were five themes. But I hadn't identified it to myself that there were five. It was just like, oh, here's that I wish I hadn't worked so hard conversation again. I've had this conversation before. Oh, here's this one. This is, you know, because they came from different angles, I hadn't actually narrowed them down into five bullet points. But I also knew that there were these five common conversations, even though I hadn't numbered them. And so it was just because of this seminar, which I hadn't enjoyed at all, but it gave me the idea to put it into point form that I thought, okay, well, let me sit and think about this properly. And I sat down and I wrote out, you know, what each of the regrets were. I thought, oh, okay, there's five. And then I looked at a couple others. I thought, no, that's, that's the same as number one, but it's, it's just said a bit differently. Oh, that's the same as number four, but said a bit differently. And that's when I, yeah, I just got it, got it down to, to five. So that article ended up getting, I think, something like 8 million views in three years. What, yes. do, you think it, what <laughs> do you think it was that caused people to connect with those five regrets? I think that it was so simply written 
because I'm not an academic. I just wrote it as one person talking to another, so it was very relatable. I just think it was the timing, just that I found a niche where the world's consciousness was ready for it and I certainly didn't intend to. I just wrote what I knew and that was what I knew. But I think that mostly because it gave people permission to make changes and so many positive changes in the world have been made as a result of the article and then the book through people that have read it. And when you were getting rejected 20 and 25 times, what message did that send to you as someone who written this viral article about this important subject? Well, I just thought stuff them. <laughs> I just thought, okay, well, I've been rejected from so many gigs I applied to get and so many festivals I tried to get into. And so I just had just kept going with that and been independent. So I thought, okay, well, clearly there's a message here. And I guess the amount of people who had read it and were writing to me telling me how the message had affected them gave me the confidence to think, no, okay, well, stuff it. If you guys don't want to publish me, I'll publish it myself. So there was never a thought of quitting when it came to the book, especially because I didn't know what else I was going to do. I knew I couldn't go back to care work. I knew I couldn't go back to banking. I knew that I was a different person than who'd gone into depression. So I was pretty much just open to whatever life put in front of me then. And and I, I knew no other way forward. It was almost like I'd burnt my bridges behind me. And Yeah, so I just thought, okay, well, I'll put it out myself. And that's what I did. And then four months later, it had gained enough traction to for me to be offered a a publishing deal in the same 24 hours as my daughter was born. (laughs) Yeah. It's amazing. And we're going to wrap this up now because I want to respect your time. But I normally ask the question... How do you define success? And obviously, you know, the conversations I'm having, we're not talking about material success. So people will talk about, you know, following your heart and, you know, things like that. But you have a catchphrase, and I'm going to just fit this into this question. Smile and know. You said smile and know a lot uh, near the end of, of the book that I read about the top five regrets. And I want you to just talk about what that actually means in a practical sense. Okay. So if you're doubting something and you're getting caught up in the fear of it if you actually just smile and think about it then you can't feel scared and sad about it so i had asked for some guidance like how's this going to unfold and i got that guidance just smile and know and so it's it's an act of faith faith with joy attached and so if you get yourself all caught up in trying to work out how everything's going to happen you don't need to know all the hows just smile and know that it will and that's and that's it just smile and know and then you're getting out of the way and life can breathe a big sigh of relief and say oh thank goodness now I can help you yeah you're ready beautiful thank you and so the last thing I want to do here I'd like to kind of loop it back around and just offer a few reflections of my own after hearing more of your story almost without exception Bronnie when I have these conversations with people and they talk about the things that they've experienced in their life, there's a strong connection to their favorite toy or activity as a child. And, you know, when you were back in Northwest New South Wales, when you and Prinny having your adventures and experiences, Mm -hmm. the thing that she made you feel is the thing that you essentially helped us feel. You helped your palliative clients feel that. You helped the women in the jail feel that. And even to an extent, the people who you were performing for feeling that because you were leading with vulnerability, you're leading with your heart. And that's what cute little animals do. That's what dogs do. And that's what we love about them. We feel like we can be ourselves around them. And you've embodied that in your work. And I just want to acknowledge you for that and acknowledge your courage and your bravery. There's so much we didn't really talk about in your story, (laughs) which is a good thing. It's a good thing that you've done so much in that regard that we couldn't even get to all of it in a reasonable amount of time. So I encourage those of you who are listening to definitely pick up. You've written three books now, correct? Yes, yeah. So just the top five regrets. regrets. Yeah, Yeah, and then your, your year for change and bloom. Yeah. Yeah. 
So no, I, five, I five regrets is what everyone knows. Yeah. Yeah. Did you write it yourself? Because it's so well written, it almost yeah. feels like there's a ghost writer or something oh, no, helping you no. out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wrote it and I sent it out unedited. Like it had reached over a million people globally before it was edited. And it was only when I said to the publisher, do you think we could edit it before the film comes out? Whenever that's going to be, COVID has delayed it. He said, yeah, let's just do it now anyway. And so the new release is is sort of an edited version. But no, I just wrote like I was writing to my best friend. And I love it. It's done so well. I don't, I don't know. Who would you like to play you in the film? Oh, probably the young, the young Brani. Yeah, I like really like Mia Vosikowska. I think that's how I'd say her name. I really love her. I'd like it to be an Aussie. Um, <laughs> I'd like probably Chris Helmsworth could be my love interest. I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to that. I don't know. Whoever, whoever resonates with the story the best. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I want again thank you so much for just being on your path and being courageous enough to be the black sheep and to own that role in your life and to blaze the trail for the rest of us. We didn't get a chance to talk about my personal experiences, but we have a lot in common with nomading and just a lot of the things following your heart, meditation, et cetera, et cetera. So I was super excited to talk to you. I did want to mention though, that you do have a course right now called Write for Delight course that you created for people who, like you were at one time, have this inclination to express and be creative in creative writing. So is that something that is on offer and how do people find it? Yeah, sure. I've I've got Regret Free and Loving It and Write for Delight, two courses. They're they're at bronnieware.com. And yeah, Write for Delight is, is aimed at people who just keep talking themselves out of it and think too far ahead and forget how much pleasure there is in expressing themselves through writing. And uh, it's helping a lot of people. So hopefully it will help some of your audience as well, Light. But I, I'd also like to say thank you for what you're bringing to the world. You, you have such a, a wisdom and, and lovely energy about you. And I'm, I'm really delighted that, that life has come and crossed our paths together through that strange sphere of social media. So, you know, many blessings to you. And I'm so grateful. Thank you. Yeah, we've made it to the end of the tunnel here. <laughs> so, and you know, it's funny because I have been so familiar with the five regrets for a long time. I first heard it in a song by this, it's like a compilation album called One Giant Leap. I don't know if you know about that, but in one of the songs, there's an opening dialogue where this person, I think it's a scientist talking about the five regrets. And it's been in my consciousness ever since then. And of course, I've seen it a lot. And and so it's, it's definitely out there. It's pretty prevalent, as you know. And yes. uh, so I'm, I was excited to put a face to a concept or a philosophy that mm-hmm. makes all the sense in the world. So yeah, thank you so much for joining this conversation. And I'm wishing you all the best. And uh, everybody, like I said, make sure you read more of the work. It'll leave you so inspired to keep going even though things aren't necessarily happening in the way that you think they should be happening. Just smile and know. Thank you for listening to my chat with Miss Bronnie Ware. She's written the top five regrets of the dying plus two other books. And she's currently offering a writing course called Write for Delight, which looks very exciting. So if you've been wanting to tell your story, Write for Delight could be that first step that we were talking about in the introduction, at least check it out and see if it's something that resonates. And you can get details in the show notes below. And in the meantime, if you want to hear more stories like Bronnie's, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast and poke around a little bit in the archive. You're going to find several other episodes with fascinating people who've overcome all kinds of crazy odds in order to discover and start their movement. And as you'll see, there are no superhumans out there. These are normal people like you and me The only difference is they said yes to what was in their heart and they kept saying yes even when it seemed scary to do so. That's it. The path is built into our life. All we have to do is say yes to what we're feeling and sensing in our heart. It seems too simple to be true, but that's why I wanted to share these stories because I think we need to hear it over and over and over again in order to gain the level of trust that it takes in our own heart to keep saying yes to it. That's why I'm so appreciative of all of you who've taken a couple minutes to rate and review the podcast because the time you spend doing that 
will help countless other people discover these incredible stories and maybe they'll be inspired to start their movements as well. Also, don't forget there's a transcript of the interview on my website, lightwatkins.com tunnel, along with a link to sign up for my daily dose of inspiration email, which is a short and sweet daily motivational message that you'll get from me each morning at 6 a.m. Pacific time. I've been sending this out to thousands of people every day since 2016 and people get addicted to them, which is a good addiction. And of course, if you have any feedback or suggestions, you can reach me directly at 323-405-9166. Thanks again for listening and I look forward to seeing you back here same time, same place next week with another story from the end of the tunnel.